when you don't know the way of the Spirit. Oak House Church brings to you the word of life, which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. But for today, we're going to be looking at sanctification. And we draw our main text, chapter number 5, verse 25 to 27. Ephesians chapter number 5, verse 25 to 27. Some of you don't, you don't understand spiritual things, honestly. A lot of people don't, you don't understand spiritual things. Many. Come closer. This seat at this seat. Don't stay at the extreme. Stay here. It's okay that line you are. It's okay that line. This, all this place is empty. Come forward, sit in the front. Don't sit at the back. Except there is any special work that you are doing or any special duty. In the absence of that, just obey. I want to give you an example of discernment. I don't know whether I should say it. Because I ha we have people who are here for maturity class. But sometimes, like that young man, do you understand what we are saying? Including you, Daniel. Do you understand what we are saying? Hmm? The guy behind you. <coughs> have you done um, model one and two? He has not done model one, he has not done model two. And he's in a maturity class. What about you? You've done model one and two. Hmm? Has God allowed you to do maturity? Okay. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Two things. That he might sanctify and wash or cleanse or cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The main definite purpose for which Jesus Christ redeemed the church is so that he might sanctify the church and cleanse the church. Sanctify and cleanse. What is sanctification? Anytime you hear the word sanctification, what it means is is broken down into two words, sancti and fication. Just like you say, beautification. What is the meaning of beautification? Making something beautiful, is it not? That is the meaning of the word beautification. What about the word clarification? making something clearer. Okay? So when you say sanctification, what does it mean? 
making something sanctity. The word sanctity means holy. It means making holy. So the word sanctification means making holy. Is that clear? So anyone, anytime you hear the word sanctification, is talking about making holy. And one thing that you know about holiness at any point in time deals basically on separation. Holiness is about separation. So that you don't mingle something. You don't mingle that person or that thing with the rest of the things. You become separated. You bring it out. Bring this one out. This one is not supposed to be here. Bring it out. You bring it out. You are separating it from the rest. So sanctification means separating. To separate from. What are you separating the in this case, he's talking about believers. What are you separating the believers from? You separate the believers from three major things. Number one, you separate from Satan. Number two, you separate from sin. Number three, you separate from the world. You separate from Satan, you separate from sin, which he says that sin shall not have dominion over you anymore. You are dead to sin, not dead in sin. You were dead in sin before you got born again. Now that you are born again, you are dead to sin. That is, sin has nothing to do with you and you have nothing to do with sin anymore. And then, concerning the world, he says in John, 1 John 2, 15, what does he say concerning the world? Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. Because the things that are in the world are the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Separate yourself from the world. So when you hear Paul said, I have been crucified, crucified to what? He has been crucified to the world, and the world has been crucified unto him. So he's talking about separation. Sanctification means separation, to separate from Satan, to separate from sin, and separate from the world. It hasn't finished. Unto God. When you separate, you don't separate it and leave it in the air. You separate it unto someone, unto God. So God separates you for himself. He separates you unto himself. He says, this microphone now is, you know there is a microphone that is here. That red big one. Okay? It's not this one. This one is the one they use. There is another one that is here. It's meant to be pastor's microphone and nobody uses it. So when the pastor comes here to speak, he uses it to preach. So it is not for any other person. It is separated from them unto the pastor for his own use. Is that clear? That is the meaning, the concept of the word sanctification. Sanctification means to separate from Satan, to separate from sin, because the Bible says that you have been translated from the kingdom of Satan onto the marvelous light. So you have been separated from Satan, you have been separated from sin, you have been separated from the world onto God for his own use. So if God is going to use you, he's going to separate you from, he doesn't want you to be a common person that is found in the midst of all these people doing the things that, no, he's unique, he's separated. That is why the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, he says that we are, but you are what? A chosen, you see, a chosen generation. You have been chosen. Okay, and a royal 
priesthood and holy nation, you see, a peculiar people that you should do what? Show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness on into his marvelous light. It's a separation. And you must be separated and you must stay separated. And now, after being separated, that is what God did for us. The next thing that he does is he cleanses us. And I'm going to tell you the reason why the cleansing and the separation. The separation comes first. And then the next one is cleansing. I'll give you an example. Something can be Something can be clean, or let me put it this way as a question. Let me put it to you as a question. Is it possible for something to be clean but not sanctified? Is it possible for something to be clean and not sanctified? Is it possible for you to be clean? but you are not sanctified. Excellent. You guys are wonderful. That's why he's a maturity class. The reason is because if, for example, in your house, okay, you have some utensils, some plates and spoons, and then when you come to the house, like in my own house, what my rev did was that she went to the market. She bought golden spoons with golden forks, with golden knives, gold. He called the house help. He said, the day I will see anybody touch this spoon to eat in this whole world, it means that you are ready to go, that you are not going to walk again here. So those spoons and those cutleries are what separated from the common use. No matter who you are, including Pastor Yakubu, if you come to my house, they will not use it to give you food. They will use the other spoon. Now that spoon is separated unto me, but it can be dirty. It's kept for me, but it can be dirty. So when I want to use it to eat, what happens? They will go and clean it. So, but can something be clean and be and not sanctified? Can something be clean, but it's not sanctified? The reason being that it is clean, but it is for common use. But you see what he has done to you now and for us. He has separated you from everything that is of the world unto himself. And so he keeps cleansing you. The reason for the cleansing is because we are still in this world. He says in 1 John 5, 18, And we know the whole world lies in darkness. And darkness is also affecting you and I. So that is why we need to continue to clean up ourselves. If you don't do that, though you are sanctified, you are not clean. You can be sanctified, but you are not clean. But you cannot be sanctified without being clean. But you can be clean without being sanctified. Is that okay? We understand it. I think we are on the same page. So, we look at a certain scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he said, For which... 2 Corinthians 6, please. 6.14. 6.14 He said, Be ye not unequally yoked 
together with unbelievers. Talking about the world. For what fellowship had righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion had light with darkness? Verse 15. And what concord had Christ with Belial, or what part had he that believed with an infidel? And what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17. Wherefore, see sanctification now. Wherefore, do what? Come out from where? Among them. And be ye what? separate said who said oak house it is not a denominational thing it is not any other thing but god's commandment said the lord and do not and do what and touch not the unclean thing and i will do what receive you so the condition for god to receive you what he means is that you can be sanctified but God will say not to receive you. The reason why is because you are sanctified. Because I can come to the house, those golden spoons are fine, but they are dirty. Will you use it to eat? If you come to the house and they give you a spoon that is dirty and you are expected to eat with it, will you eat with it? No. So in this case, my spoons are sanctified, but they are dirty. So I can't use it. I will drop it. I can't use it except it is cleansed or washed. So that is why he says, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Verse 18. And I will be what? A father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters. Says who? The Lord Almighty, the Almighty God has spoken. So you see, this subject of sanctification is not anything to play with. And this is the reason why a lot of people, the people who, pro, who propagate once saved, forever saved, they don't believe in this sanctification. They say you have been sanctified, that God has sanctified you, and they give you scriptures. But this message, this particular scripture is talking to who? Those of them that have been sanctified. Go to verse 11. Okay, it's 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Don't go there yet. I will come there. Now, when we talk about sanctification in the Bible, there are three phases of sanctification. There are three. There are three stages of sanctification. <clears throat> we use the word three stages in order to, for, to be able to explain it. It's not that if you go to the Bible, you say three stages of sanctification, number one. It's not. But... You, you, we are going to see the scripture so that you understand what it means by the three stages of sanctification. There is the first sanctification. It is called, there are three stages of sanctification. The first one is positional sanctification. Positional. I'm going to explain what it means by positional. The second one is called progressive sanctification. The second one is progressive. Then the third one is ultimate sanctification. There are three of them. The positional, the progressive, and the ultimate sanctification. What is the positional sanctification? That positional sanctification is what when God did that positional sanctification in your life, was when you received Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and as your Savior. He brought you out 
and he sanctified to he now said i have sanctified you i have chosen you from among the group you are now a called out people you are now a chosen generation god separates you that is what god did so that is what is called positional you got it when you first received jesus christ into your life first corinthians chapter 6 verse 11 He said, and such we are some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified. Remember, these, these words are in the past. It's not in the present. It's not in the present continuous. It is something that happened in the past. You have been sanctified past. When was that? When did that happen? That was when you received Christ into your life. He said, and such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That is what is called positional sanctification. You are sanctified the moment you became a child of God, the moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. You become sanctified. God sanctifies you. He separates you. That's why he said you are now a chosen generation. You are now a royal priesthood. You are now a peculiar people. You are now the called out from darkness into the marvelous light. Is that clear? Acts of Apostles chapter 20 verse 32 also throw more light. Acts 20.32 And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are... You see, this one is in the past, sanctified. Okay, now let's look at... Now, just like I, I, I explained to you, we look at now the progressive sanctification. Now that you have been sanctified, now that you have been cleansed and sanctified, remain what? Remain clean and remain sanctified. Because now, when you bought this lectern or this uh, pulpit, for example, you bought it new and you brought it to the church on the pulpit here, you clean it and dust it and dust it, you spend maybe like one hour cleaning everywhere and all of that. When you finish, you close the door, close the windows and all of that, you go home. Then on the day of the service, you come, will this pulpit be dirty? Because of dust from everywhere. So what do you need to do? You clean it so that you can have the service. Then after you have finished the service and then you share the grace in the fellowship, everybody goes home. And then you come back next week to hold service. Will this pulpit be dirty? So what do you do? So you keep cleaning it every time you come. Why will you have to be cleaning it all the time? Why? Because there is a persistent dust everywhere. No matter how you close the doors, no matter how you shut the windows, no matter how this place is airproof, there will still be dust here. It's from the environment. There's nothing you can do about it. So what, but what you do is that you subject it to constant cleaning. And this pulpit will not be used. It will not be higher. Maybe these people that are doing all one bed, they will come to Oak House Church and say, please, um, can you people give us rent your pulpit so that we can do all one bed for one, two days and they will bring it back? No. It has been sanctified unto God. It can never be used for any other thing. So what we keep doing with it here is we keep cleaning it. We keep making sure that it is clean every time. That is what is called progressive sanctification now that you are saved now that you are washed now that you are sanctified maintain a sanctified life maintain a life that is clean make sure ensure that you clean up it is your duty it is your responsibility 
to make sure that you keep on doing what? Cleaning yourself. If you don't do that, you will be dirty. And because you are dirty, God cannot use you. If you are dirty, God cannot use you to do anything. Are we making some sense? God will not use you to do anything if you remain just like that. So that is why you need to keep on cleaning yourself. It is your duty. It is your responsibility. That explains also the reason why the Bible says, walk out your salvation with fear and with trembling because God is a consuming fire. If you don't do that, he will consume you because you will be dirty. Although you are his, but you are dirty, you are unclean. So he can't use you, he can't bring you into his kingdom. He can't make use of you. So, that is the reason We look at 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13. 1 Peter 1 13. Where forget up the loins of your mind, the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former loss in your ignorance. You see what he's saying? Verse 15. But as he which had called you is what? Holy. So do what? Be holy in all manner of conversation. In other words, be holy in everything that you are doing doing because it is written be ye holy for i am holy so you see this one is a progressive sanctification that is what you're supposed to be doing every day you need to clean up yourself you need to sanctify you need to make sure that you are sanctified you no longer join you don't just one of the ways you get yourself contaminated is when you find yourself in the midst of these people and then you do the things they do and you get involved and get yourself entangled in the affairs of this world you get yourself defiled and contaminated and then you need to come out First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. First Thessalonians 1, 4 to 4. First Thessalonians 1. What am I doing with this person? First book of Thessalonica, chapter number 4, verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to do what? Walk and to please God. How you need to walk, how you need to live, and then please God. So, you will abound more and more, verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people who are already saved. They are born again, they have received Jesus Christ. They are now Christians. For you know what commandment we have given or we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. This is what? the will of God, even your, even your what? Sanctification. So sanctification is a perfect will of God for every believer. That you should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel 
in sanctification and honor. You need to know how to take care of your vessel. You are the vessel of God. You are the temple of God. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20, he said, in a great house, there are vessels of gold and of silver. Not only vessels of gold and silver, but there are also vessels of what? Wood and earth. Some to honor and some to dishonor. He's talking about the vessel, your human body, your spirit, soul, and body. That's what he's talking about. So that First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, is saying that you need to know how to hold your vessel in sanctification. You need to know how to keep yourself sanctified. That is separated from sin, from Satan, and from the world unto God. You need to know how to clean up yourself. You need to know how to remain pure and clean. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, if you read chapter 6, there's, there are some things he was saying. And so when he came to verse chapter 7, he said, Having therefore these promises I was talking to you about before, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, he's still telling us about the progressive sanctification. There are many scriptures in the Bible that talks about progressive sanctification. So, what is the third one? What is the ultimate sanctification? Is going to be ultimate because First John chapter one verse eight says, "If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us." So, no matter how you remain sanctified, and no matter how you get cleansed, you will still be dirty. Even if you get yourself so cleansed and so sanctified and cleansed this moment, in the next five minutes or ten minutes or one hour you rem you will get dirty again so if you say you have no sin what happens we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and that is it why because we still have this body this body is still subject to death that is why when somebody dies, you leave the person after 24 hours, the body will start decaying, it starts smelling. It's because it, there is still corruption there. If eternal life is in this body, if eternal life has entered this body now, and you die, this body will not be decayed. It will not decay. Just like what happened to the body of Jesus Christ. His body was in the grave there, as fresh as it was when he first gave up the ghost. That body was still intact. So he came back and picked up because that body was not, the Bible says, he could not see corruption. So, but we see how this body, that is one thing that God is waiting to change. To change this, our vile body. So that at the end of the day, it will be said that mortality have... Uh, be swallowed up by what? Immortality. And so we have a glorified body like that of Jesus Christ. That is one of our blessed hope, one of the many hopes that we have. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make 
the captain of their salvation, perfect through suffering. So what he's doing is to bring us to glory, to glorification, when we are going to be ultimately glorified, when there will be no sin in your spirit, there will be no sin in your soul, there will be no sin in your body. You are clean inside out. A time is going to come when that will happen. And so that is when 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 49 1 Corinthians 15, 49, we are talking about now the ultimate glorification. He said, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of what? The heavenly. That is the image of the heavenly. That is that kind of body that Jesus Christ had. We are going to bear that body. We are going to bear that kind of image. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. For our conversation, that is our life, is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious what? body, according to the walking whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. We are looking up to that time when this our vile body will be changed. The Bible says, in a twinkle of an eye, we shall be changed. We will become like him. Our body will be changed into the same body of Jesus Christ. And that is why he said in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 1 to 3, anyway, is but he, he said, What manner of love has he bestowed on us? What manner of love had, had the Father bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Therefore, the world knoweth us not because he, it knew him not. Verse 2. He said, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like what? Him. For we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him. That is one of our one of our hope. No matter how you clean this your body, no matter how you do it and all of that is still subject to sin and death, corruption. Is that clear? What, are, what is the meaning of the word sanctification? What are the three phases of sanctification? What are the three phases of sanctification? Okay, first, what is sanctification? Separated from unto God for his use. You remember Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 20. But in a great house, there are vessels of there are vessels of gold and of silver, but also of vessels of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to what? dishonor. Verse 21. If a man therefore do what? Purge himself from what? These. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and prepared or meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You see, you are separate separated for the use of God so that God can use you. That is the end of the end result of what? Sanctification. The end result of sanctification is so that you can God can use you to be a blessing, so that you can serve God and his people. So that you can serve God and in the gospel before you can serve God, he has to separate you, cleanse you up. You can't live a dirty life and say you are serving God. He will not. That is why he will not accept anything from your hand that is unclean, that is defiled. When you are having grudges and keeping malice and you are backbiting and lying against people and saying what they, you defile your body. You get your body defiled. 
And anything that you go to offer God under that condition, it becomes an abomination to God. It is called dead works. God is pure. God is holy. We read it. He said, for it is written, be ye holy because I am holy. It's a commandment. You can't just be doing anything because you feel that. If your heart is not clean, because as we shall see anywhere later, you find out that your heart, the altar, the altar that God, that we are talking in the, the New Testament altar is different from the Old Testament altar. In the Old Testament, the altar he's talking about is those brazen altar, the physical altar where they come and worship. But in the New Testament, the real altar is the altar of your heart. The real altar is the throne of God. Your altar and the throne of God, that is the same altar. They are not too different. Because the Holy Spirit is living in that, your altar, the temple. He say you are the temple where the Holy Ghost is living. It is the same altar with the one that is in heaven. So if anything goes wrong with your heart, if there is any spot or any wrinkle or blemish in your heart, God will not take any sacrifice that you are offering. He won't take any gift. Whether it is message that you are preaching and a whole lot of world are winning and they are giving, giving their life to Jesus Christ and all of that, fine, they can be saved. But as far as heaven is concerned, you have not done anything for heaven. You have not done anything for God. As a matter of fact, it's an abomination. That is why you say, if your brother, if you know that your brother has something against you and you're coming to give gift, that gift could be preaching, that gift could be money you are giving, that gift could be sweeping the church, that gift could be singing in the choir or playing drum or in the media or shooting cameras and all of that. Whatever it is, if you notice that somebody has something against you, drop it and go and reconcile with the person first before you can offer that thing so that it becomes a sweet smelling savour unto God. This is the kind of God that we are worshipping now. This is the kind of God that we are serving. That is why you see sanctification is not for babies. The closer you get to God, see, the closer you the closer you get to God, the more afraid you become. The more afraid of God you become. Because you see, you know, you know, if there is a very big light here and you stay on the main road, the impact of that light will not be much. You can afford to open your eyes wide. But as you are stepping in, the intensity will keep increasing and you keep closing your eyes. And you get to a point where you can no longer look up to that light because it will dazzle your eyes. That is how it is. The closer you get to God, the purer you become. And the more afraid you become. That is where you say the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, when you talk about sanctifying yourself, what aspect of yourself do you sanctify? Because a lot of people say, the, those of them who are propagating that once you are saved, forever you are saved. It does not matter what you do with your body. You can lie with your tongue. You can cheat. You can defraud. You can sleep around. You can commit adultery and funny, all kinds of whatever. That anything that you are doing is not from your spirit because it is your spirit that is saved, that is born again. And it is your spirit that is going to heaven. That is what they say. What they say. Which is half truth. And you know, half education. It is very dangerous. So you have to have the whole truth. If it is not whole, then it is not true. Because Satan brings half truth and half lie and mix it up. First Timothy, uh, First Thessalonians chapter five, verse three, for verse twenty-three. First Thessalonians five twenty-three. 
and he says and the very God of peace do what sanctify you holy and I pray holy what does he mean holy is going to tell us what the what is involved in that holy that is total and I pray God your whole spirit your whole soul and your whole body be what preserved how blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ you see your spirit your soul and your body must be blameless on the day Jesus is coming no spot no wrinkles no blemish and there is nothing you can do you can add to it you can remove it you see this your body it must be clean you see your soul it must be without spot and wrinkle and blemish you see your spirit it must not be defiled you must not harbor any evil thoughts you must not harbor any uncleanness, unclean thoughts. You must not harbor any bitterness or anger or malice or envy or backbiting or gossip or hypocrisies. And you know all those things that are of the world. You need to rid yourself of them out of you. If you're found in this, you will not get to God in heaven. You will not live with him because one day you, you start keeping malice with God. If you can keep malice with someone here, you can keep malice with God. Did you hear people that say, I'm not by them, I, I stop going to church. I'm angry with God. So he, they are not talking to God anymore. And they will get to heaven, they will continue from where they stopped. Amen. Is that clear? If you have questions, you can ask if you're confused. If you are confused at any point, okay? Now, let us look at the process of that progressive sanctification. Because that is where the issue is. The ultimate sanctification is done by God and is finished. The, I mean, sorry, the positional sanctification, the first one, it has been done. And then the third one is God. God is the one that did the first one. He is the one that will do the last one. But the second one, the middle one, if he is going to do the last one, then you have to do the second one. So let us look at the processes of uh, the progressive sanctification. And then we are going to look at how do we get sanctified and clean in a more practical way not just preaching it in a more practical what are we supposed to be doing the first the process of progressive sanctification give me Romans chapter 12 verse 1 all of them are written there we are going to read to verse 4 I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God, that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Service. This is the first process. Number two, and be not be conformed and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good. Well, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This is the second process. The process is the first one, the second one. Stay number two, verse two. So he said, and be not conformed to this world. Okay? The second one is that don't conform to this. So what does it mean to conform? 
to be like, to behave like them, to, to copy their attitude, to copy their pattern, to follow their footsteps. Do not conform. So he said the first one is to present your body. Number two, do not conform yourself with them. Number three, be transformed. And then the fourth one, renew your mind. So that you can know the will of God. So the first one is you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What does it to present your body a living sacrifice? There are things that these eyes must not watch. Hmm? There are things we must not watch. Because you have offered these eyes as a sacrifice. There are things that this mouth will not say. There are things that these hands will not do. Because these hands are holy. They have been sanctified. Your eyes have been sanctified. Your ears. There are things that this ear must not hear. There are places where this leg must not go to. There are things that this body must not wear. He must, there are things he cannot wear. You must present your body. This your whole body is holy unto God. So whatever you want to do with this body, you have to find out from him. Because you are no longer your body. You have been bought. With what? With a price. You are no longer your own. You need to glorify God in your body, which is God. You cannot just be using your body and doing whatever you want to do. You watch what you want to watch. You listen to what you want to. Both, both gossip and, uh, and uh, um, all kinds of gossip and all kinds of lies and all of that. You listen to it and all of that. And you go to places. You find yourself always in the beer parlor. You go to nightclub. You do all those things. You find your place in the midst of uh, Yahoo, Yahoo people and all of that. And all kinds of evil. And uh, wherever you will find yourself, they know it ought not to be so. You need to separate yourself from among them. You don't join them and do the things that they are doing. You, it's not that you are going to be their enemies. We will greet, we will smile, we will talk and all of that. Even the talk that we are doing is uh, clean talks. If you, dare, if you try to say things that are unclean and all of that, I will stop you at that. If I know that I cannot stop you, I will walk away. If, it is, if you are in my territory, I will tell you to get out. You can't defy that place. So that is why you say, present this your body, a living sacrifice. There are kind of clothes you wear. Not the type that when you wear it is, 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 is very seductive and all of that. And there are some clothes that you are supposed to be wearing in your bedroom and all of that. You see them wear it and all of that everywhere. And it exposes every part of your body and all of that. It is seductive, it is nude, nudity. It is not good. There is one they call a spaghetti hand and all of that. When they say praise the Lord, you lift your. That is why he said we ought to know how to carry our vessels in sanctification and honor. That is what First Thessalonians four four say. You need to know how to carry your vessel, your body, in honor. You are a royal priesthood for crying out aloud. You are a priest. You are a royalty. You come from royalty. 
not anybody maybe you're a lady people men will come and be cracking dirty jokes and you are smiling and because you are a lady and you don't talk you just be smiling and they are cracking all those jokes with you and you know they are dirty they are sensual or else or maybe somebody stands there all these unbelievers even if he's a christian and carries his hand and put around your waist and be asking, looking at your face and all of that. For what? I, I, yes, I know. It's not that... Um, but because you don't know what is in the heart of these people. It's not that holding somebody is evil or bad. But you see, the heart... I hold people, I hug people, but my heart is, my heart is as, as clean as this. I don't have any of those. But these people out there, no. You can't just, even the brethren and all of that, you have to know. Because not every one of us, not every of us here that is, that their head is correct. <laughs> you have to, you have to be careful. Carry yourself with dignity, with respect. Somebody say, dress the way you want to be addressed. I see people when they wear, I see them, when I see them in the church, the first thing that I do, especially those young boys, I will call them, you see, you see what they wear. You see trousers that are torn and they go to market and they buy it. Even if it is one single hole here, why will you do that? Why? Don't wear such things. It speaks volume about you. It shows what is in this side. You know, the heart of man is desperately wicked. The Bible says, who can... There are so many things evil, bad... But you don't know it. And such things, those, those things that are not clean and are bad in your life and all of that, they show on the outward, known or and unknown to you. They show on the outside. You can imagine somebody goes to the market and buy jeans that is torn, the one they tear like this. And maybe you bought them 80,000 naira for one. And then you are coming. Ah, Pastor, pa I'm sure Pastor will be glad. Pastor will be happy. And all of that. And then you put it in a package and sent to me. And I now open it and I saw that it is. I will throw it inside the fire. And when I see you, I will finish you. If you want to get, buy something that don't stop. These are the things that are copying from the world. There are some that you see, they are like rag. I see them. I said, oh my God. I said, did you, is it by mistake? He said, no. I said, you bought it like that? He said, yes. Where did you buy? He said, in the market. You actually put your hand inside the pocket and brought out money. And then you gave them and they collected it and they gave you this one. Were you blind when they gave you? He said, no, your eyes were open and you collected it. And you wear it. Ah, something is wrong inside. The heart is dirty. I don't care how I don't care who you are. I don't care how you present yourself or what you think. The heart is dirty. But you may not know because the heart is desperately wicked. There are some evil locking. That's why David says, Search my heart, oh God, to see if there be any of such things. He never knew that he could sleep with somebody's wife and murder the person. Murder somebody's wife and to in order to he never knew he could do it. There are some things that we see where you do, you know. And when I'm saying it, it happens to me, me that is talking to you, that is preaching. I'm also not exempted. I hope I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not exempted. So when I see such things, I will fall on my face. I will cry to God, please. It happens to me. The things that are locking in my heart that I know, I don't know. That is why the Bible said to always examine yourself. To know whether you are still in the faith. 
Let him that thinketh he does what? Be what? Careful or else. It's God that is saying that. Now, how can we achieve this progressive sanctification? Number one, by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. This is very, very, extremely important. Very, very, very important. So give me 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We shall read 13 and 14. He said, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the spirit and the belief of the truth. So sanctification is by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does what? Sanctifies. Is that correct? Is that, is that understood? First Peter chapter 1 verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctification of the what? Of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So you can see sanctification is by the Spirit, okay? Now, the one million dollar question is this. In what practical way, you know, we're talking about practical. In a more practical way, how does the Holy Spirit sanctify? You know, we're talking about sanctification. Sanctification is what? Separation, is it not? Making holy is separation, okay? So, in, since the Holy Spirit is the one that sanctifies, in a more practical way, how does he do it? Because you need to know. Because it is when you know now, you can now cooperate. Ignorance is a very big problem. My people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. So, in a more practical way, how does the Holy Spirit sanctify James chapter 4, verse 5. Practical way, he does it. Do you think that the scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusted to envy? This is the more practical way the Holy Spirit does it. And what do I mean? You can, you can show them NIV or NLT. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? What does it mean to envy? The spirit is envy. You know when somebody is envy, he says he's envy, you are jealous. Somebody, you are protective. You don't want the person to do something. You don't want the person to talk to another person. You don't want the person to go to somewhere and all of that. You are just protecting the person. You are just not happy that the person is doing this or doing that and all that. You are jealous. When somebody is, uh, maybe now he's Pastor John, if somebody sees you now, sees, um, you see somebody now talking to Barista, you know, and Barista is laughing and feeling cool. And then John's hand will be vibrating like this. You know what is going on? He is jealousy. He doesn't want, he just, he, because that lady has been separated unto him for his own use and all of that. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing. That is the reason why when you lie, when you say something that is wrong, he reacts. Except your conscience is dead. 
That is why when you say something that is not true, hey, come on, Kayana Sapaka Yapara. Or maybe you are somebody, you are keeping malice with somebody and all of that. You won't sleep. You are, this Holy Ghost that is inside you is real. It's not comfortable. That's what he's doing. He doesn't want you to get involved in that. He doesn't want you to go to that place. If you find yourself going somewhere that he doesn't want you to go, the peace, you, you start feeling uncomfortable. Something inside you starts. He is jealous of you. That's a practical way he separates you. He sanctifies. He doesn't want you to go. Remember sanctification is separation. He doesn't want you to get involved in that thing. He doesn't want you to say that thing. That thing that you said is not good. It's bad. That thing you said to that lady is bad. That thing you said to that brother is bad. That thing you did is bad and all of that. If you don't see, eh? if the Holy Spirit is alive in you, even when you do something like this to somebody, you feel you are dying. He convicts you. That is the practical way by which he sanctifies us. But guess what? A lot of us are dead to the Holy Spirit. We don't even feel anything. You see, it doesn't matter how many times you are in, you are in the Spirit. If you grieve, that is why he said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Why will you grieve? You get him angry. You annoy him. He has emotions. The only thing that he wants you to do is to do things that are clean, things that are holy, things that pleases the Father. Uh -huh. So when you go against it, something inside of you starts to react. That is why we call something. But it's the Holy Spirit that is reacting. That is the way, the practical way he sanctifies us. And when you pay a deaf ear to that, he said, my spirit will not strive with man forever. He will let you. There are places that you want to go, okay? And he's not happy that you are going there. That is why he said the spirit is striving against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. There is always battle. And if you yield to the flesh, you conquer your spirit. The Holy Spirit is grieved. The Holy Spirit is quenched. There are people today, Christians, I'm talking about Christians, I'm talking about pastors. They will lie and they are normal. It doesn't bother them. You tell somebody that you are coming and you didn't go. You say you are coming and you didn't come. The Holy Spirit inside you will tell you is wrong. But because because you have, um, over time, you keep piling and piling and piling and piling. You become callous. You become insensitive. A lot of us are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. There are people in the physical, they are so sensitive to everything. When you smile, they read meaning into why you are like when, whatever it is that you say, they will read all kinds of meaning and all of that. They are very sensitive, too sensitive for everything. But that is your sensitivity is supposed to be directed to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You want to marry that person. You want to say yes to that person. And when you make up your mind to say yes, something inside of you he doesn't want you he doesn't want you 
So don't go ahead and if by any means you have said yes and the Holy Spirit doesn't want you, don't call, uh, uh, Pastor, uh, I have something to ask you. Um, uh, there is something I, the Holy Spirit was telling me not to say yes. I think somebody actually called you and was asking you that kind of, I don't know how to. The Holy Spirit told her not to say yes to that man. And then she said yes. Um, is, there, is it a problem? Is it a problem if I should continue? Hey, there's no kind of thing I won't hear. The Holy Spirit told you not to say yes. And then you went ahead and say yes. And you are calling my rev to ask her whether there is a problem if you continue in that line. There are two ways I deal with some people. When you ask such question that are stupid i will tell you as a matter of fact carry yours what have you been doing since so you have not followed you have not gone i want to i will tell you it is so i want you to disobey the holy spirit well 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 tell him that you are the lord of your life go with the guy what kind of madness is this So you see, in a more practical way, the way the Holy Spirit sanctifies us is by this means. Is that clear? Is that clear? So when you hear the Holy Spirit sanctifies, that is what it means. Another way, the, another agent of sanctification is the Word of God. In John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctify them. So the truth or the word of God does what? Sanctifies. Say the word of God sanctifies. Okay. Now, again, in a more practical sense, more practical, how does the word of God sanctify us? Because I need to know. So, that takes us to the book of Psalm 17, verse 4. Psalm 17, verse 4. Psalm 17, 4. Concerning the works of men, by thy word, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from what? The path. Of destroyer give me niv or nlt as for the deeds of men as for the activities as for the lifestyle as for the things that we do by the word of your lips i have kept myself from the ways of what violence or destruction and all of that what is he saying through thy word the word is a lamp unto my feet is a light unto my path it shows me what to do and what not to do the kind of business i should go into and the kind of business i should not go into the kind of uh, friends that i should keep and the kind of friend i shouldn't keep and all of that because it's sanctification it cleans you it tells you so that you don't get involved doing this kind of dirty business and all of that the word of god says don't go there don't do it defraud not one another lie not to one another keep your promises his words are yea and amen so these are the things you do you don't get involved in this it remember sanctification is about separation so there are aspects of the word of god as you keep as you keep hearing it as you keep reading it and studying it you now know that god does not want you to do this he doesn't want you to do that he doesn't want you to keep malice he said be angry and do what and sin not and let not your anger go down with the sun that is what the word of god that is why he said the word of god is a lamp unto my feet feet is your leg is what you used to walk he's talking about your way of life he's talking about the activities of men there are things that you do is the word of god that opens it and shows you that is why he says it's like a mirror
as you are looking at it, you will see, thou shalt not keep malice. And you look at your life, am I keeping malice? So that you keep away from it. Thou shalt not live a life of hypocrisy or gossip and envy and all of that. You check your life, I am, am I doing it? So that you refrain from it. That's how the word of God does what? Sanctifies us. Is that clear? The third one. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29. Hebrews 10 29. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished? Who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace? The blood of Jesus Christ sanctifies. Now, another practical way. What is those practical way by which the blood of Jesus Christ sanctifies? Remember, it is sanctification is talking about separation. Okay? In a practical way, in what way do they does the blood of Jesus Christ sanctify us? First Corinthians six twenty. The Bible says that you were bought with war at a price. What did he use to buy you? Hmm? You were bought at a price. What is the price that was used to buy you? Is the life of Christ. And the Bible tells us that life is in the blood. Okay? You are bought. In this particular way, in this particular case, the way, in a more practical way, the blood of Jesus Christ sanctifies us by knowing that you were bought over, that you are no longer your own. You need to know that. First Corinthians chapter 7, 23. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6 20. You can go to 19. 19. First Corinthians 6 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own, verse 9, for verse 20. You were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. You need to know that a ransom, according to 1 Timothy 2.6, according to 1 Timothy 2.6, you need to know that there was a ransom. Do you know how if a kidnapper kidnaps someone, they say you are going to pay so and so amount of money in order to regain the freedom of that person. That is the kind of thing that Jesus Christ did. We were under bondage and under condemnation and all that. And then God sent his only son to pay the price. The, the price that he paid was his life. So with that life, he purchased your liberty. You are bought with a price. You need to know this. You are now bought. You are no longer your own. You are no longer for the world. He bought you with a price, separated you from the world. You need to know. Just like the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 6, in that verse 11, he said, you need, you know that, you, you need to know that your old man has been crucified. You need the knowledge of it. Likewise, reckon you also to be dead unto sin. In verse 14. For sin shall have no dominion 
shall have no dominion over you and all of that. So you need to know that you have been bought with a price. That is a reason why, that is a reason why, that is a reason why the Bible encourages us, God encourages us to always break bread and take wine. The bread and the wine is the ordinances of the New Testament that God commands that we ought to do it as often as possible. When we do that, we remember that we are bought. That you are no longer your own. That you are somebody's property. Just like a wife, just like a woman who is married... You know, you know, there are things you cannot do as a married woman. There are places you cannot go as a married woman. There are kind of friends you cannot keep as a married because you know that you are now married. You are now espoused to this man or to this woman. That's how it is. So because of that, you keep yourself. Exactly. How many have I mentioned? The fourth one. Matthew chapter 23 verse 19. The altar. Matthew 23, 19. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. So the, gift, the altar sanctifies. The altar sanctifies, it separates. How? The same way the blood sanctifies the altar. What does it mean? You should know. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. <laughs> what does it mean? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. We are talking about a more practical way the altar sanctifies. It is practical in this way that you, you know now that you are bought at a price with the very precious blood of Jesus Christ. Just like a woman is betrothed or married to he, her husband or the man is married to his wife. It's no longer business as usual. There are things and all of that. That same way now, you you are married to Jesus Christ. So what you need to do on daily basis, anytime you go, you offer yourself, I surrender. You know, uh, was it not, uh, which day was that you were saying, the uh, offering of your, give offering of your life and all of that. What does it mean? It is this. You are being sanctified by the, because you have given your life. You have surrendered your life to God. You are no longer, he said, present your body. When, how many times do you present your body? As often as on daily basis. On daily basis you present it, you offer it. Because it is another way of sanctifying, that altar sanctify. And you know, anything that is offered to God is no longer for common use you know some of you you see how some of your shrines I don't know whether you are still keeping them in the village or some people still believe in all those deities blind dogs and dump dump idols and deaf idols that can't see that can't and you are afraid of them and all that you see in my village in those days when people come to inquire of the gods they bring some animals and sacrifices and offer to the deity. And sometimes it's goat and sheep and cow. 
So what they do is that they make a mark on the ear of the animals to indicate that for just for identification. And they will leave the goat and the sheep and all of that. And he'll be walking about, entering people's farm and all. And if he's eating your, your crop in the farm, and you carry stone, and you hit it, just that you hit it, he didn't die, you are in trouble. Not, not to talk about killing it, or they say that you stole, that your generation will go. It is the same way. The things that are offered to God, you don't go and take it for another use at all. You can't. And you have to do something to keep reminding yourself that you are offered. That is why Paul said, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, it is expedient that I put you in remembrance. Because man is forgetful. You need to keep doing something to remind yourself that you are you have been offered to God. There are things you need to keep reminding, put in place. And what is it that God has put in place and all of that about us is by, through the blood of Jesus, or through the communion. When we come to the communion table, one thing you remember is that you remember that your life is no longer in your hands. It's in the hands of God. That you have been bought with a price. So you have to keep doing that. You have to keep reenacting that on daily basis. When you wake up in the morning, Heavenly Father, I thank you, I give you praise. I come before your presence. You see, I come by the blood of Jesus. That is why he said in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, let us come boldly to the where? To the throne. If you come boldly to the throne of grace yesterday, will you come boldly to the throne of grace today? Will you come tomorrow? So why is he saying that? It's a way of letting you know your life has been bought with a price. You are no longer your own. You've been sac sac uh, sacrificed unto God and sanctified and separated. That's how the altar. And anything you offer to the altar, you don't go and take it back. You got there are some people, when they give offering, they come and drop offering. Hey, Pastor, I have 500 naira. Give me 200. One came one day, first one. Can you go do change? Change, change how much? He brought 200 naira. Can you go do change? How much will I give you? How much will I give you? 115. Offering. Can you do it to the idols? If you go to the shrine, and the high priest, that shrine man, tells you, bring, uh, what is in your pocket? Bring it, bring it, bring it. And maybe it is the money you are home and abroad. You mistakenly brought 1,000 naira and dropped it. Uh, and then you remember that it is 1,000, you don't have money to go back home. Will you tell him to give you change? You will tell the high priest to give you change. High priest, because you to go to him change. It won't give you change. <laughs> it will abuse the hell of you, out of you. And it will threaten you, it will threaten you with a curse. Anything that you have offered to God, you can't take it back. That is the same way you say, he that swear it to his own heart. You don't change. You don't repent. You have offered that word. Your word has gone to God. You can't take it back. Therefore, be slow to hear or quick to hear but slow to speak. Let your words be few. Study to be quiet. Pick your words. It is better to be slow than to be fast. At least when you are slow, you are behind God. And when he is going, you are behind and you are far. At least you are looking at him. When he turns right, you know where he turns. So when you get there, you will turn. 
But if you are fast ahead of him, when you get to the junction, you will take left. <laughs> when he gets to the junction, he will take right. I would prefer to be slow with God than to be faster than God. Alter, practical way. How does this sanctify us? Do we understand it? Do we understand it? You are talking as if you don't understand it. If you don't understand, can I see your hand up? Uh, if so, if you understand, say yeah. yeah. If you don't understand, say nay. <laughs> How many what have we talked about? But then the fifth one. Acts of Apostles chapter 26, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by what? Faith. So you are sanctified by faith. You are sanctified by what? Faith. In a more practical sense, how does faith sanctify us? Practical, because we are dealing with practicals. You see, when you apply these things, when you apply them, you are going to begin to see the power of God in your life. That's how the power of the glory of God will rest. Because God will not do anything on an in, in unclean vessel. So you need to keep sanctified and keep yourself also cleansed. Because you can't be sanctified and still dirty. You can be separated. To, you know, we discussed it in the beginning. You can be separated to God, sanctified, but you still be dead. So we're going to look at how to be cleansed. So, but in a practical sense, 2 Corinthians 4.13, you know what faith does? You know what faith does? Faith does what? Believes it. All these things that we have heard, we believe it. And because I believe that my faith in Christ, who has redeemed me by his blood, set me free, from my enemies, from all the things of the world and all of that, I believe it in my heart. And then what do I do? That's sanctification. This faith is what it covers both the Holy Spirit sanctification, the blood, the word, the altar, and all of that is by faith. You believe it in your heart and you do what? You say it with your mouth. I have been sanctified. I am a chosen generation. I am a royal priesthood. I am a called out person. I am a peculiar person. My case is different. I am not a common man. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. When you confess those words, it comes into effect. The power behind that, the power of the blood will come. That's why the Holy Spirit, that's why the Holy Spirit now becomes very active in your life. It becomes very effective in your life. When you give a voice to what he's doing, you are acknowledging what he's doing. You are on the same page with him. You are saying the same thing and all of that. That is the mind of God. That is the will of God. That is the perfect will of God. That's what God wants you to do. As you are saying it, speaking his word, talking about what he's doing, acknowledging what he's doing. Philemon 1.6. Philemon 1.6. Philemon is only one chapter, just like Jude. Philemon 1 6. 
Philemon. You can't find Philemon. Can somebody please read it so that we can... Okay. He said that the communication of your what? Faith. You see, sanctified by faith in Christ. That the communication of your faith may become what? Effectual by acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ. So when you acknowledge it with your, your heart and you say it, it becomes effective. The effectiveness of it, the power that enables it to be established in your life is released. It's by speaking, giving it a voice. First of all, you know, believe it and acknowledge it by speaking. Faith believes and it speaks. Amen. I'm just rushing now. Let's look at the divine cleansing agents. You know, you are sanctified and then you are cleansed. So how, what and what cleanses us? The first is the word of God. The word cleanses. John 15, 3. John 15, 3. Now you are clean through what? The word which I have spoken unto you. So what it means is that the word cleanses, is it not? So in a more practical way or sense, how does the word cleanse you and I? The word, because you are now sanctified, the word cleanses you. And how does the word? Because it needs your own cooperation. So what it means is that as you hear the word of God, as you hear what the word of God says, and you obey it, you are clean. But when you hear the word of God and you do not obey it, you will not be clean. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That is the word of God. And then in obedience, I shall not commit adultery and I will not commit adultery. You are clean. Because you heard it. That word that you're hearing is doing something, is producing faith in you. And that faith demands obedience. That is why James chapter 1, verse 21 says, For us not to be just the hearer of what? Of the word. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your souls. Verse 22. He said, But be ye not doers of be ye not, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, your own self. Verse 23 says, For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face as in a in a glass. Verse 24, he says, For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgeteth what manner of man he was. If you are hearing that word of God, that is supposed to cleanse you. And maybe, for example, now somebody is committing fornication and living an adulterous life and all of that. And then you, you heard a message. You heard a message either on, from the pulpit in the church, or you listen to a tape, or maybe MSP, devotional, and... all of that. You listen to that thing. It reveals what you are doing inside of you. It shows you that you are not clean. Okay? Now, you will repent. You get convicted of that thing that you are doing and then you stop it and start doing something good. You stop that act. When you obey it now, that is what makes you what? Clean. Is that clear? So if you are the hearer of the word and you are not obeying it, it will not work. You cannot be clean. That's why you see somebody can be coming to church, he's born again, he's a Christian and all of that, but he's living with another woman that is not his wife. 
And you come to church here, you hear that thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not commit fornication, and all of that. So, someone who is going to make a change in his life will now say, when he gets home, he tells the lady, you see, this is what the word of God said. I heard it in the church today, and this is what the scripture says concerning that. So, you have to go. You see, that word has cleansed you. But when you still hear it and you go home and continue living with the woman, it has not cleansed you. Is that clear? Another cleaning agent or cleansing agent is the blood of Jesus. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. This one is automated. You know what is automated? It's automatic. It, it, it goes on its own. But there is something that you need to do and then you trigger it off. It keeps on doing that job. It does that cleansing. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with what? One another. And the blood of Jesus Christ does what? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, does what? What is clean set? The normal English word is what? Cleanses. Is it not? Give us NIV. Let's see whether it is true. Clean set. Let's, look, let's see what they say. You see, he said the blood of Jesus, his son, does what? Purifies. Plural. You are not the one that is commanding the blood to purify you. Is the blood automatically purifies you? The blood automatic is automated. Is ongoing. It doesn't stop. But there is something that you need to do in order to put it into operation so that it will become operational on its own. What is it that you need to do? Hmm? First John, go back to first. Uh -huh. But if we are living in the light, you cannot be living in the darkness. If you are in the dark, it will not be automatic. It will not be automatic. But when you are living in, what does it mean to live in the light? Everything you inherit. Give me Colossians one twelve. Colossians one twelve. Give me Colossians one twelve. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of life. Give me KJV. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in inheritance of the saints where? It's not in the dark. If you he who knoweth to do good and doeth it not is living in the dark. The blood will not be automatic cleaning you. Because you see, there are things that you, there are things wrong in your life, but you don't know. There are things you have said. There are places you have gone. There are decisions you have made and all of that that are not good, that are anti-God and all of that. But because you are maintaining a fellowship with God, because you are not keeping malice with someone, you know that keeping malice is wrong. You know that Bible says that how many times will my brother sin against me and I'll forgive him? He says 70 times 7. That is 700 and what? 90 times in a day. In other words, as long as he sin against you, you'll forgive the person. But you don't want to forgive. You live in unforgiveness. You are living in what? In the dark. The blood of Jesus Christ cannot have us. It can never be automatic. It can never be automated. If you want to put that machine, they call it ATM machine. That is um, automated teller machine. It's automated. Once you insert the card, and press the button. Yeah, he said, 
there, are, there is no, your ledger is 60, 670 Kobo or 670 Naira. Finish. That is the money is finished. Automated. There's nothing you can do. No matter how you press it, no matter how you want to reconfigure it, it will show you that there is no money. So, what do you do in order to you have to insert the card and then punch the button. In this case, you have to walk in the light. Keeping malice, unforgiveness, gossiping, lying, and you know there is something wrong. When you know that there is something wrong you've done, he who knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. So you cannot be living in sin and expect the blood to automatically wash you. It will not. First John 3, 9. And finally, I... First John 3, 9. Whoever is born of God, do not do, do, not do what? Commit sin. He doesn't live in unforgiveness. He doesn't keep malice. It doesn't make practice of sin. So what, how you know is that when somebody does something bad and all of that, the person, he repents, he turns away from me, he asks God for forgiveness and all of that. And then the blood takes care of the ones that you don't know about and all of that, so that you will be clean, so that that fellowship will continue, the, the Holy Spirit and all of that, your spirit man become very strong. You have boldness. You have confidence. Amen. I'm just going to read out this one. I'm not going to stay on it because of time. Because you know we're coming back here by 11 o'clock, 12. We still have less than four hours. So I will just have to read this one. The result or the benefit of sanctification when you live a sanctified life. A life that is sanctified and clean. Just like the Bible says, you now know that you are a son of God. You can beat your chest and say, I am a son. Not everybody that calls me Lord, 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 but those of them who do what? Do the will of my. There are so many Christians that God is still their God and not a father. Until you keep your leg, because I've told you, if you don't keep yourself clean, you can be sanctified, but you are not clean. But you can be also clean and you are not sanctified. You are clean, and but you are for common use. They will hire you, you go to nightclub and sing. And then they pay you. And then you come back. You are clean, but you are dirty. You are for common use. And then you can sing unbelieving songs. You are for common use. So that is why he says, 2 Corinthians 18, and say, I will receive you, you will be my son, I will be your, your father, and you will be my son and my daughters. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, say the Lord Almighty. Why? Because you fulfill to 19 I mean 14 to 17 you have fulfilled that and then you become because he said come out from among them and touch not on clean things and all of that and I will receive you and I will be your father and you will be my sons and my daughter that is the first the second Hebrew chapter 12 verse 10 the second one sharing in his holiness for they for they verily for a few days chastened us you see after their own pleasure, but for but he for our own profit, God corrects and chastises us and corrects us and purifies us and does all those things. He doesn't want us to get into mess and all of that. Why is he doing that? That we might partake of his word, holiness, so that we can share in the holiness of God. If you are not sanctified and clean, you cannot share in his holiness. 
You can't carry the presence of God. You can't carry the glory of God in your life. And of course, 2 Timothy chapter 19, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. You remember that in uh, uh, verse 19 to 20, 21, he says, In the great house, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord or Christ depart from what? Iniquity. Because in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor verse 21 if a man therefore purge himself from these he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the masters he use and prepared unto every good work so that you can be rest assured that what you are doing is acceptable to god good works you can be rest assured that what you are doing, offering to God, is coming from a pure heart, a holy incense that comes from that altar that is clean. My altar that is crying to God, that altar is clean. And number two, or the second one is that so that God can use you. There is a difference that the reason between a man that uses God and the man that God uses is a man that uses God. That is, they tell God what they want, not what God wants. So, a man that God uses is a man that is clean in the heart. You become a vessel, the one that God uses. He will not say, depart from me, I knew you not. No, he said, I know you. I know David. I know David because he's a man after my heart because he will do all my wills. I know him. For partake of the inheritance of the saints in light. Your inheritance is in the light. Your inheritance is not in the dark. Your inheritance is not in the dark. What are your inheritance? Your inheritance, one of the inheritance, the inheritance you have here, the inheritance you get to heaven. So there are two ways. So your inheritance on this side, for example, using the name of Jesus Christ is your right and your privileges in Christ. Is it not? But there are some that will say in Jesus' name nothing happens. And the other people say in Jesus' name and something happens. Some people will pray and they will get result, and some will pray and never get result. For example, they said, if your brother sin against you, forgive him. If you don't forgive him, neither will your heavenly father do what? Forgive you. And so if God does not forgive you, and you go to pray to him, you will not get answer to prayer. You will not enjoy that inheritance. Your inheritance is in the light. You cannot be walking in the dark. You cannot be living in sin and say you are praying to God and all of you are wasting your time. You cannot be keeping malice with somebody and say you are praying to God. You are wasting your time. God doesn't hear the prayers. So that is why it is in the light. Your inheritance is in the light. Your inheritance is not in the dark. You cannot walk in disobedience and in disunity and you are planting seeds of discord. That is why you see this thing about Christianity. You see this thing about Christianity. You know why I love it so much? Why I enjoy it so much? You can be doing so many things on that. Nobody knows. Nobody sees you. You can be witch hunting people. You can be backbiting and lying and stealing and, and, uh, and sleeping around and all of that. And cover it. Nobody will know. Hello. Hello. One thing that I know the way that I know my name is Fred is that no matter how you hide pregnancy, <laughs> it will show. True or false? Jesus put it this way. He said there is nothing that is hidden that will not be brought to light. When I hear, when I read after this kind of, what, what, so why would I be playing pranks? It's clear, obvious. So even if I decide to be to be pretending and all of that, there is a, a day will come when the whole thing will show up. Your nakedness will open up. Is that what you want? Fake lives. 
You can be doing all those things in the world, not in the body of Christ. So inheritance of the saints in the life, you can enjoy divine health. I can't remember the last time I went to hospital. I said that I am sick. It's not that we don't get sick. If I am sick, it's because I overworked myself and I exposed myself to God because most of the time when I sleep, I, I don't wear clothes. I just lie down. Even with the AC, when the AC is too much, I carry, I carry all the pillow that is in the bed to cover myself. Even the one that my wife is using, I will pull it out. Put on my head. So what you decided to be doing, I will go and carry her own pillow. Say, don't touch this one. This is my own. You have three or four pillows to yourself. It's to cover my cold. I don't want. Like... So when I do that, sometimes I cold enter my body, and I will suffer it for a period of time. That's the sickness that I have. I have warned you, I have warned I read in my Bible, it's not subject of this discussion. Let me tell you something. I want, God will keep, if God, Jesus, tarries. You know how I'm going to die? Do you know how Abraham died? You know how David died? You know how Isaac died? That's how I'm going to go. Did God show me? No. Pastor, how do you know? Live a pure life. Live a clean life. Live a holy life. Don't play with the word of God. Don't start arguing with God's word and don't keep away from all those things. Separate yourself. You will be clean. The day you are tired, God is ready to go. He will tell I want to die like Kenneth again. They are the people that I read after. They are the people that I follow. I want to die like Derek Prince. I want to die like E.W. Kenyon. Not that they were sick and they are carrying them from one hospital to another hospital to another hospital to another hospital and then, no. Live a life of obedience. Live a life of truth. Separate yourself. You see the word of God. When you see it, he said, who shall I look upon? He said, those of them that dread, that tremble at my word. They have the fear of God in them. If God says it, that settles it. I may not know it, but the moment I come to the knowledge of it, everything I surrender. That is a man after God's heart. That is a godly man. God will not allow you to see that kind of corruption. The day you are going to, he will tell you and all of that. You pray for your children and all of that and cross your leg. You say bye-bye. Live a clean life. As much as God gives you that grace. And the grace is there. And of course, your sins. You know, I said a couple of things. Um, the final one is that because you are living a holy life and all of that. That is why we say, how many of you are ready, are sure, convinced beyond all reasonable doubt that if trumpet sounds now, you are off? You know why you will raise your hand with every degree of assurance? It's because you are living a sanctified life. Something that is sanctified must be clean. You have to keep yourself clean and sanctified. So because you are sanctified and you are clean, at any point in time, he shows up. You are bold to go. That is what he says. I'll give you this particular scripture. They that we are looking forward to his coming. First John chapter 3, verse 1. First John chapter 3, verse 1. Fast, please. Behold, what manner of love had the Father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God? Therefore, the world knoweth us not because he knew him not. Verse 2 says, Beloved, be, now that we are sons of God, it does not yet appear what we shall be. But, want, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3. And every man that had this hope in him does what? purifies himself it purifies he didn't say purified purified that's continuous he purifies himself even as he is 
pure. Even as Jesus Christ, he purifies himself like Jesus Christ is clean. If you have this hope in you, so you are sure, you are confident that any time rapture occurs, you are gone. You are sure that if anything happens today and all of that, by any means or by any whatever, that you are heaven bound. It is when you live a sanctified life, you can be rest assured, you can beat your chest. That's why Hebrew chapter 9 verse 28 says, in Hebrew chapter 9 verse 28, he says, So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he do what? Appear the second time without what? Unto sorrow. Without what? Have you seen it? The same thing he kept repeating without sin. And what do it make you to be above sin? Because sin shall have no dominion over us anymore. What will make you to do that? Because you are living a sanctified life. Sanctified by what are the agents of sanctification, divine agents of sanctification? Number one, the, number one is what? The word of God. Number two, the blood of Jesus, number three. The altar, number four. Faith, number five. The Holy Spirit. These are the divine sanctifying agents. What about the cleansing agent? And, and you know the very practical way, because I love things that are practical. You put things that you do. Not just things you heard. So, so that you are now left with the option either to do it or not to do what? Not to do it. The choice is yours. And with this, I rest my case. God bless you. So let us pray. Father, we thank you today. We bless you. We honor you. We give you praise. For the entrance of your word gives light, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our father. You have brought us thus far. Thank you for what you are doing in the lives of these, your children today, Lord. Father, we continue to pray for each and every one of them as they are seated here and those of them that are online that are listening, Lord. Father, it is our heart cry and our heart desire that you write these words in the tables of their fleshy hearts with the very finger of your spirit that they will remain indelible in their lives, O oh God, so that they will continue to live to the praise and glory of your name in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Glory be to your name. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. So tomorrow we look at... Um,